In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> I'd like you to turn to page two of your bulletin and look at the collect, if you would. Page two. Oh, that's right, there's screens. So there is no page two. Let me, uh, let me read to you the order of service that I have in the collect. I think it's very good that as you listen to the words of the collect, that a collect in the order of service is always a summary statement or a theme of the order of service. Now, notice what the words were. O Lord, grant us the spirit to hear your word and to know the one thing that is needful. Now, I want you to think for a moment because here Martha is asking Jesus to somehow reprimand her sister. Now, I want you to think for a moment, what is the one thing that Jesus is referring to? In other words, we might ask ourselves, what's most important? Now, that seems rather rhetorical because I think as we age and as time goes on, different things are important to us. Maybe when we're younger, it is to find that special individual to be our husband or our wife. Maybe it's about a career or going to school. Maybe as we get older, it's to buy a house or to achieve certain goals. And as we get older, maybe it's to retire and to live the dream of retirement. But somehow and in some way, as our lives change, things seem to be a little bit different. We seem to value things a little different. In other words, that which is most important to us might really change. But in our story this morning, we see that for Martha, she is really going that extra mile, isn't she? She somehow is making all the preparations for Jesus. I think most of us would try to do that. Most of us would want to be about making sure everything is right for our guests. So she goes the extra mile, but somehow she learns rather quickly Mary has chosen that which is most important. And she looks at her sister Mary and says, somehow she should be doing what I am doing. And Martha gets annoyed. Now, maybe you have felt this way or had has gone this way in your life with a sibling or a situation where all of a sudden you are preparing ever so quickly and so efficiently to get something done, but yet your sibling isn't doing anything. But in this case, somehow, Mary has chosen the one thing that is needful. In our colic, that one thing is not named. In our text, that one thing is not named. But somehow, our Protestant work ethic reminds us to work hard, to accomplish, and to do things. And if we don't, somehow we're deemed to be lazy or to be more like Martha and not like Mary. Sometimes when we look at the biblical stories, I've noticed over the years that we try to identify. We think these stories are somehow a case example that we should be, well, maybe more like Mary or more like Martha or less than Martha and less than Mary. Either way, we try to pick one or the other. Maybe we try to have the patience of Job. Maybe we try not to doubt as much as doubting Thomas. Maybe we try to remain convicted as Peter denies Jesus. But in one way or another, we look at these biblical stories somehow as something that we are to identify with or be. And so I think sometimes when we look at this particular story of Mary and Martha, we look at it as a choice that we need to be more like Mary and less like Martha. But the fact of the matter is it is two sides of the same coin. The reality is you have tasks and a vocation. You certainly have work to do today and tomorrow and in the days ahead. That somehow you just couldn't be in church all day and every day as wonderful as that might sound. Or it might be really nice and pious to say that every day I will be in God's word and pray all the time. But yet you know if you are a farmer or a busy mother or a grandparent, sometimes there are so many tasks before you, it just simply slips away. 
If I was to tell you that when you really look at this story, it's not so much about are you more like Martha or are you more like Mary. The fact of the matter is that really isn't the point of the story. As much as it is a very good and helpful insight that we should have the patience of Job and the trust of the disciples and also like Thomas and a commitment to follow Christ like Peter, if we simply look at them continually as examples, it becomes a very strong burden. It becomes overwhelming. You get burnt out in the faith. It would be likened unto give as God has given to you. Now, on the surface, that is a wonderful, true statement. But if it's taken to the extreme, the fact is you could never, ever give, never give, as much or as freely as God has given to you. Now, I know why we say it, and I understand the idea behind it. But if you really think about it for a moment, and if I kept saying to you, if you only give as God has given to you with your time, and your finances, and all your talents. Every Sunday, I said, if you would only give as God has given to you, it would become an enormous burden every Sunday. Because the law is always a familiar companion to us. In other words, we would know instinctively that we fail, that we don't always give as we should or serve as we should, or use our gifts and talents as we should. We know that. I know that. The first thing I thought of as a retired pastor is this will be great. I don't have to go to church anymore. <laughs> That'll be a nice thing. Until my aunt kind of instructed me, well, you're going to church, right? And she was very happy that I was serving another church as to imply somehow, well, I'm glad you're doing something. But, but I think my point is, even myself, we instantly go back to, oh, this would be great. I don't have to do all this stuff. But the reality is the law is always gnawing at us. To be more like Mary and less like Martha. That's not the point of the story. The point of the story and the one thing is, the very one thing that Mary understood that God was giving to her that day. The very grace and mercy and love that he gives to the good Samaritan, to the person who's on the road. This is that one thing. The one thing is the very thing why all the stories and everything in Scripture is about that one thing, that Jesus has come to suffer and die for the sins of the world. So we give in response to what God has done for us. It's always in response to what God has done for us that we give, serve, and do. And the reality is the more that we consider this and the more we look at the unconditional, the unmerited, love and forgiveness that God has given to us, we then finally understand that we can be Martha and we can be Mary and still loved by the Lord. Because let's be practical again. Obviously, there are times that we have to be like Martha. We have to do things. We have to accomplish things. But we are also like Mary that he calls us to be in his word daily, to read and inwardly digest it in some way or another. But somehow we continually think that the better we perform, the better it will be. And maybe we've been caught into that cycle at times. Our service, our caring, our prayer and our devotion life even becomes performance something that we must do instead of get to do or want to do. Even for Martha, she understands in her service, it was done in a very selfish way. I mean, she looks to Jesus and tells Jesus what to do 
about Mary, and Jesus doesn't do anything to respond back to Martha about Mary, other than to say what she is doing, what she has chosen, is good and right. Performance in the faith is nothing more than a burden, a heavy burden, one that continues to crush us and remind us on how far we fall. Because if it is that one thing that we are to do, the Lord makes it rather clear. Love the Lord with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. It's not just the first table of the Ten Commandments that apply to God, but it's the rest of the commandments that deal with our relationship with others. So the Lord would say, here they are. How are you doing? How are you performing with all of these tasks? And yet he reminds us that it's only by his grace and mercy that we live and grow in the Christian faith. But the collect helps us to understand this again that it's by the hearing the Word of God and by His Spirit do we fully understand what He wants of us. It is by His Word that we understand that we are to inwardly digest, read, and learn it. In the very similar and same words that Jesus says to the evil one, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word of the Lord. This is where we get this idea to inwardly digest God's word, as the catechism says. It simply means to take in God's word as a life-saving source of all things. And this is what Mary and Martha soon learn. But for us, this is really about what God does, what God is, and what God brings to us. We see this in the wonderful parable of the Good Samaritan, and we see it here again. Those moments that we are like Martha, we know that. Those moments that we are like Mary, we feel that and see that. But at either place, at either time, which either side of the coin that we are on at a particular time, we realize that the one thing is needful. And for us at this service, we realize that it is on the table and the altar before us. Christ's body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. This is the one thing that is needful. Think about that. Is that the one thing that you thought about is most important today? Now I realize you might have many tasks and responsibilities today. You may have thought of other things to do other than go to church. I understand that. Those are all normal and real things. But it's by God's Spirit in continually feeding on His Word and inwardly digesting it that we would understand and comprehend by His Spirit that one thing is needful. To continue to remind us of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. This has stuck with me for many years in ministry. And Luther said this, and it's a great reminder, and I say it often and remind myself, but think about this, that the law is always a familiar companion and the gospel is a stranger. So since that is true and correct, the law is always heavily pressed upon our hearts, our shortcomings, our sins, our mistakes, our poor choices, whatever they are. They are ever before us. They keep us up at night. They make us worry. They make us doubt. But the gospel is a stranger. And since the gospel is a stranger, it simply means that Each and every time and day that we hear it, it's like new. Because it's a stranger. It's foreign to us. It doesn't come intuitively to us. And so this is why worship becomes a routine and a pattern. And a devotion life becomes a way of life. Because the very words of eternal life are like a stranger to us. 
because that law is ever pressed upon us. And I assure you that the evil one would like nothing more than to continually to remind you and roll through your mind all the stuff that you have done wrong to not be good enough, righteous enough, holy enough, only to come to receive the gifts that God desires to give that it might be wiped clean. In all the years of ministry and the states that I've lived in and the churches that I preach at, you know, it really doesn't matter because everybody's the same. They may dress a little different, look a little different, building may be different. The more things change, the more they stay the same. People are people, sin is sin. Because if we can call sin, sin, and forgiveness, forgiveness, you understand the one thing. Call sin, sin, and forgiveness, forgiveness, and you get it. Because our Lord knows exactly how to call sin what it is. And more importantly, to give and to show us forgiveness as forgiveness, right? And so the only way we know what this looks like or feels like is if we look to the cross, or in this case, sit like Mary to take in this one thing. The one thing has always been the one thing. It's always been what Scripture speaks about. Jesus came to do this one thing, that you may have life and life to the fullest in the forgiveness of sins. I assure you, take it not for granted. It is the grace of God that understands that we need to receive that which he has suffered and died for us. And this is why it's maybe the greatest words within the divine liturgy. When after communion, you get to hear from the shepherd or the pastor, and now may this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Or as I said and have said to shut-ins for over three decades, there's a wonderful collect in those who are suffering or shut-ins and homebound. And it would remind them because when they're separated from the fold, separated from the church, things seem very different. They seem isolated and cut off from the very gifts that are dispensed and given on a Sunday. They don't always get to hear their sins are forgiven. They don't always get to receive Christ's body and blood. But your faithful shepherds continue to serve those in need, as homebound and shut in as I know. But I love these words and have long remembered them. And when I used to visit shut-ins back in Missouri, I had an elder who would come with me who was 91 years old. He went with me on every single visit. He taught me more about the Christian faith than most would. But it was always amazing when Ted would tell me, he says, you know, these words are so simple, but we just need to remember them. 91. He was basically blind, and it took us so long to accomplish one task. But he understood the one thing that was so meaningful. 
that you would receive Christ's body and blood, that you may bear all crosses, sickness, is and trials until you grant us deliverance, peace, and health. That's the full embodiment of life, that you may bear all crosses, sicknesses, and trials, and in all circumstances of the Mary or the Martha, until you grant us deliverance, peace, and health. That's the one thing that we reside and hold on to the very gifts that God gives to us. Amen. Please rise.